We have a new arrival at Grumpy Headquarters. A BSA 300 watt generator, or charging set if you prefer. These were a more or less exact copy of the Johnson Chore Horse, made under licence in the UK by BSA. And yes, it is heavy. I'm not sure of the date of my unit. These sets were made from World War II right up until the 1960s. Maybe the identification plate will hold some clues. Could that 53 be for 1953 maybe? Over the years they were produced in different voltages, but my unit should output 15 volts with a maximum current of 20 amps. There's even an electric start button once you've got it hooked up to some batteries. There's no compression at the moment, probably just sticking valves, but I'll know more once I take a closer look. This won't be a how-to video, I'll just film some of the work as I go along in the hopes that some people find it vaguely interesting. The fuel tank is in the base here, with a vented filler and drain plug. The oil filler and sump drain are at the base of the engine itself. Step 1 is to clean off some of the general detritus before I open anything up. Obviously I could blast the whole thing with a pressure washer, but I'd prefer to take a more controlled approach. And as a side note, I wouldn't be at all surprised if this cord on the flexible exhaust is asbestos, and some of the gaskets are likely to contain asbestos too, so a little care is needed when working on old stuff like this. Just as a little interlude, the air should enter the air filter round the sides of this top cap. It should then pass down the sides of the inner sleeve, directing it down towards an oil bath in the bottom of the housing, up to this fill line, before passing through the wire mesh and finally heading towards the carburetor down this central tube. But if you take a look at how it had been assembled, there were these incorrect spaces on top of the sleeve, so any air entering the housing could pass over the top of the sleeve and straight down the tube albeit being somewhat restricted by the top of the sleeve covering the tube. These hard fibre washers that should seal the housing to the lower pipe need to go too, and I've made a new cork gasket to replace those. I don't know exactly what the upper missing part should look like, but I figure it would be something like this. Now the sleeve section is raised, allowing air to pass through the filter and down the central tube as it should do. The top of the sleeve section sits inside this ridge in the top cap, creating a seal to prevent air from bypassing the filter section. Now that's sorted, I can carry on with the engine itself. I could do with getting the spark plug out, but it appears to be fairly stuck, so I'll apply a little heat to the area to try to ease things a little bit. That should be reasonably warm. I'll add a little more oil which should capillary down the thread as the thing cools. And that's still pretty solid, so more heat required. And it's still solid, although there is a tiny bit of movement now. I ended up progressing onto the big breaker bar and more heat. And finally we had movement, and at the point I got the plug out you'll hear my discovery of just how rusty it was inside the combustion chamber. Oof. So time to remove the outer frame and the fan cowling to allow a bit better access to the engine itself. The engine still has its original braided spark plug lead and choke cable, both of which are clipped down to the fan cowling, so these will need to be detached before we can progress any further. The fan cowling seems to be in pretty good condition, so nothing more than a quick clean up required there. And getting the frame off is a bit of a challenge, but eventually it lets go once you've figured out the correct orientation. Rather handily, the head bolts weren't seized like the spark plug was, so this part of the process went pretty smoothly. As a matter of habit, I always place bolts like these into a sheet of cardboard so I can reinsert them in their original locations upon reassembly. assembly 
And now a gentle tappity tap tap with a piece of wood to break the seal. And a little jiggle, trying not to damage the gasket too much because I can use it as a template to make a new one. And gentle prying with a palette knife can also help here too. And as before, you'll hear my expression as I discovered just how much rust there was lurking beneath the head. From the general condition, it looks like the engine has stood with water entering through an open exhaust valve, but not so much that it's got into the cylinder bore, because that looks squeaky clean and free from rust. Next, I needed to remove the cylinder barrel to clean it up properly, so the carburetor and exhaust will want to come off. The fuel is sucked into the carburetor through this thin pipe. It's a tiny little carb and pretty basic from the looks of it, not least of all because it doesn't have a float chamber of any kind. And now onto the bolts securing the cylinder barrel in place. Some of these are pretty difficult to access. I think removing the flywheel and magneto backplate would have eased this process somewhat. But anyway, I eventually got them all out. Next is to carefully remove the cylinder, remembering to support the piston and conrod, which will flop down as they exit the bore. I've got some clean cloth ready to protect the piston once it's out. It's worth taking your time, because on some engines, the cylinder can suddenly free up and the piston can crash into something, causing damage in the process. Anyway, that's it safely disassembled. I've already removed the valve springs, so I can now lift out the exhaust valve and the inlet valve, the latter looking in much the better condition of the two. I couldn't easily remove the exhaust, so I've left that in place and I'll just work round it. The inlet valve seat is in reasonable shape, but the exhaust isn't so great at all, so I'll need to do quite a bit of lapping to get that valve to seat properly. I did end up making a tool for the lapping rather than using a pair of pliers, but I didn't film that bit. The bore isn't in too bad shape, but it's a little glazed, so I'll give that a gentle hone while I've got it apart. Plenty of oil to lubricate the process, and off we go. This initial pass was done with minimum spring pressure just for filming. I then did the job properly with more spring pressure off camera so I could concentrate on what I was doing. The valve springs are easy enough to squish down with the spanner before inserting the retaining pin, being careful not to let go causing the cup washer to fly off somewhere because if I did that in here I'd never find it again. The piston and rings are fine after a little clean up, and I've cut a new, slightly thicker gasket which should compensate for the fact that I've relapped the valves, causing them to seat slightly further down into the block. I've also cleaned up the head and spent some time cleaning out the spark plug thread which was pretty rusty down at the bottom. I didn't film the reinstallation of the cylinder, but here it is back in place with everything working as it should do. Next, I'll refit the head and see how it feels for compression. Hmm, well that wasn't so good. There was no compression at all. And the reason was pretty obvious, had I paid proper attention when I first dismantled the engine. When I first removed the head, it was very clear that the exhaust valve was sitting lower than the inlet valve. Plus, there was quite a lot of damage on the top and bottom of the exhaust valve, so it's pretty clear that someone has messed with this engine in the past. And the valve had already seriously recessed into the block and wasn't sealing. There's no adjustment on these valves, and the valve stem is now too long, so the valve remains open when it should be firmly closed. However, this isn't too much of a problem. I've fixed a similar issue on my Jap engine in the past. I just need to take reference measurements to the lower face of the cylinder block and shorten the stem so that it matches the resting position of the inlet valve. I've already ground off the bulk of the material that needed to be removed from the stem on the bench grinder, and now I'm just finishing it off on fine wet and dry paper, with the valve sitting in a block of wood to keep it square, and rotating it every so often to even out any discrepancies. After that I reassembled the engine, and this time round I had compression. Next I'll take a look at the carb. I've not seen one like this before. All you see at the bottom is this metal plate, which, when the choke is open, is free to move when air is sucked into the engine. 
However, when the choke is closed, the plate is pressed against the bottom flange with the only access for air being these small breather holes. When the choke is partially closed, the plate can move a little but still restricting the airflow. The throttle is a pretty standard butterfly valve, and if I rotate it, you'll see a load more rust that's fallen out of the inlet port, so I'll get that cleaned up before reinstallation. Anyway, that's as far as I've got so far. The next step is to check for a spark, and I fully expect to be stripping the flywheel off to get at the points. And I need to change the oil, and I ought really to drop the fuel tank to clean out any rust, although I'm half tempted just to flush it out a few times. I need to make a silencer to go on the end of the flexible exhaust pipe, but I'm just dying to get it started. Anyway, that can wait for part two. If you've enjoyed watching, please like the video and maybe even subscribe to the channel, not forgetting to click on the bell icon so you get notifications when future videos are released. That's it for now, so thanks for watching, and I'll see you in a future video.